All right, good evening, everyone. Um, you're welcome to this event, and it is an honor to be here with everyone here, um, welcoming you to most likely the last Black History Month event. This is organized by the, um, the steering group under the Royal College of the General Practitioners. And um, yeah, we will be having a chat about the health and heritage of the Black hair and skin, celebrating what makes the Black hair and skin quite unique. And with me tonight, I've got um, we've got four panelists, and they will be introducing themselves as they come on to present. Myself inclusive, and then we've got our moderator, stroke tech guru behind the scenes, Dr. Alice. She will be helping with the slide management and poll launching. Um, this meeting is recorded, like you've heard, uh, so feel free um, to participate. And then uh, we've got the Q and A section, which will be quite active. We will try to answer all questions, preferably at the end of the session. But if there's anything pressing at all, we will try and answer in between. If we're not able to answer the questions all through the session, we would be happy to answer at a later date. We all know that talking about the health and the, the hair and skin is quite a huge topic. So, but we will scratch the surface and hopefully you get one or two things out of this. So I will start, we will start this evening tonight by um, introducing our first panelist, Dr. Sham, and um, I will let her take over. Thank you, Sham. Thank you. Uh, good evening, my name is Sham. I'm currently a GPST1 in Kent. Um, I've been involved with the RCGP for a while, uh, since medical school actually, and in some ways as part of the Black GP steering group. And I'm really invested, really invested in building proper equity, diversity and allyship as part of our, our profession. Um, essentially, I'm going to be starting off the session briefly discussing what makes black hair and black skin unique and some of the attitudes towards our skin and our hair. And I'm going to try and do this in 10 minutes. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so a lot of you will know that skin colour has developed over millions of years as part of natural selection. And it's been found that unsurprisingly, indigenous skin tone correlates with the UV ray distribution around the world, whereby those with the darkest skin tones are from regions and countries with the highest UV rays. And hence, this is found to be a natural um, sun barrier with the average um, inherent SPF being 13.5 uh, around um, black skin tones. However, this is also a reminder to not forget to use um, your SPF, whatever your skin tone is, to protect you further. Uh, as medical professionals, we know that skin is complex and how skin tones develop is also complex. It involves a range of genes and proteins, but essentially we've, we all know about and we've all heard about melanin. So melanin is a pigment developed within melanocytes and it's stored and secreted from melanosomes within uh, melanocytes. The amount of melanin secreted from these organelles dictates our skin tone. The Fitzpatrick scale of skin color has been used for a while to um, classify skin tones from one to six. So when I'm talking about black skin, I'm talking about particularly um, five and six. Due to the composition of black skin and the protection that we get from UV rays, and thus there's protection from DNA damage due to the amount of the melanosomes in our skin. Some studies suggest that there are also increased levels of collagen and other fibrous proteins, which helps with the effect of aging. Conversely, the high levels of collagen in these fibrous proteins can make things like keloid scarring uh, more common following wounds and trauma to the skin. Next slide, please. Thank you. So not only does your skin color and often its tone, i.e. when we see things in colorism, um, affect things such as work and life opportunities, also medically and scientifically, potentially alter your disease course, your responses to medication, and it can and will affect how you are treated by medical professionals. This has been seen and discussed recently, you know, with the black maternal health crisis, and uh, some people just describe drug seeking behavior in patients with sickle cell disease and much more. But also, can our black skin be beneficial in medicine? Studies have shown that some black medics may give preferential treatment to those that look just like them. Studies actually state that health outcomes for black patients better when they're treated by black doctors. Next slide, please. Um, now, increased pigmentation can make it difficult for some medical professionals to identify some of the characteristic traits that are commonly associated with common conditions that we're all taught in medical school and that we're taught about or see on the job. 
a lot of us would have heard about uh, Maloney's book, Mind the Gap, which was a handbook of um, images and descriptions of clinical signs and symptoms in black and brown skin. There's also some other websites um, I've seen in these pictures uh, and other communities that have just tried to close this knowledge gap that some of us have. Personally, in medical school, um, I graduated in 2020, so quite recently, I was never taught about these presentations um, of skin conditions, co common conditions on black and brown skin. And I actually felt quite embarrassed trying to diagnose these conditions in people that, you know, look like me and look like my family and just having absolutely no idea. Some studies have shown that lack of darker skin presentations, sorry, thanks, <laughs> um, in textbooks and in the curricula actually leads to patient harm and poor outcomes. So it's amazing that now a lot of universities and um, medical facilities, hospitals are using books like Mind the Gap and other resources in their core reading list. As GPs and upcoming GPs, it's important to understand these differences when diagnosing and treating dermatological conditions in um, our black communities, because misdiagnosis or delayed diagnosis affects lives in a population that's already discriminated against. Next slide, please. Um, when addressing black or Afro hair, I'm particularly talking about type three or four hair um, as seen in the picture. Afro hair also differs from Caucasian and Asian hair in its anatomy, the anatomy of its shaft and its follicular structure. It has a sharply curved follicle with the shaft being flat oval formation in a thin twisted structure to produce the characteristic look of Afro hair. Afro hair cells are linked to our heritage, our identity, our families and more. Us as medical professionals need to be aware of these phenotypical differences in hair to aid us in appropriately diagnosing and treating patients with Afro hair. It's also important to be aware of common practices in um, Afro hairdressing and maintaining the hair, which may actually contribute to disease processes or um, reflect prognoses. Next slide, please. So due to the composition of our hair and that each actual individual strand is thinner, but more tortuous than other hair types, it's likely to dry out or break. So we use protective styles to help encourage less breakage, retaining more moisture, uh, by helping with less interaction with the elements and less friction. These styles can include things like um, braids, twists, bantu knots, use of wigs, hair pieces, and so much more. Um, also the use of like silk and satin pillows, covering our hair at night. Um, and this is applicable, to, I've just got pictures of ladies, but this is applicable to both um, males and females with Afro hair. Next slide, please. So again, as medical professionals, it's important to note that some skin and hair conditions are more common in uh, the black population than others. Um, and I'm, my colleagues are going to talk about some of these conditions um, in more detail in their talk, but these are the top five, which include breakage, traction alopecia from tight hairstyles, um, pseudofolliculitis, which is razor bumps and the rest. Um, these conditions, obviously, again, they're not unique to black people, but they are more common some of which are attributed to hairstyling, um, products used, and some of these conditions are directly linked to hair practices such as um, permanent straightening, direct heat, tight braids. And there's a lot of products designed for black hair which have been actually linked to systemic disease. Some recent studies actually showed links between chemical perming and uterine cancers. So there's so much to keep in mind. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to touch on black hair in the workplace. Um, as black people in medicine, but just more in general as well. Hair discrimination started a long time back from when black people were first known to be in the UK. Uh, there was some notable cases recently uh, with a lady called Lara O'Doffin who had a job offer withdrawn after presenting to the job in braids. Biases towards our hair can be explicit like that, whereby some people are sent home because their hair is unprofessional, or well, there can also be microaggressions, people touching our hair, commenting on the variety of hairstyles we may come to work with. Hair discrimination is technically illegal as a form of racial discrimination under the UK's Equality Act uh, 2010, but hair texture itself is not aimed in the act. So it's not explicitly a protected characteristic such as race, gender. So legislation is just a bit like wishy-washy. So for a while, black people have been told and treated 
like their hairstyles and their hair textures are inappropriate, unprofessional and sometimes unattractive. Next slide, please. Um, these are just some stats. I'm not going to like read through them, but you can see that large numbers of black people and black children have faced biases and discrimination due to their hair at work or at school. And I think this is awful. Next slide, please. But recently people have been campaigning, actually for years to be fair, um, to establish that discrimination against Afro hair should be cl classed and classified as a form of racism and actually established in law. More has been done recently, literally when, you know, when I was researching to do this talk last week, um, the Equality and Human Rights Commission released guidance to the government stating that children with Afro hair are being disproportionately affected by discrimination and this is actually likely to be unlawful. Calls have been made to generalise this across um, workplaces and public settings also. And there's a group of young, black, inspiring women uh, who call themselves the HALO Collective um, that launched the HALO Code back in 2020 in order to try and end hair discrimination in the workplace and schools, um, including explicitly naming Afro hair as a protected characteristic in the Equality Act. And they're working with employers who proactively defend their their employees against discrimination and judgment of their hair by adopting their code. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for, so much for that, Shama. Thank you for reiterating the point that we still need uh, SPF despite the Berlin. And uh, I'm so glad to hear that there is a lot being done as well about the uh, discrimination um, in schools and workplaces. Okay, I will um, have Dr. Easy come on board. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shama. That was beautiful. Thank you, Ginika. So I'm just going to be highlighting and talking about natural hair products. So things that um, I have personally used. So this is all like personal experience, really. And um, just things that have helped. And over the years, five years, it's just been beautiful, the transformation that has happened um, with just using natural things from my kitchen. So my name is Izzy, I'm a GP, um, I'm a sessional GP in the Southeast of England, and I also practice lifestyle medicine as well. So um, my journey started with hair, with my daughter really, she's nine now. And um, it was just, you know, trying out things and seeing how her hair responded to the things I was trying. And coincidentally, she also suffered with eczema so every time I made her hair, her skin flared up. So it took a while to link the fact that it was whatever I was putting on her hair. And when I washed off the product, it was going on her skin and that was what was causing the flare up. So when I finally figured that out, I had to stop everything I was using because I didn't know what was irritating her skin. And then I decided to start to just use just kitchen products. And one of the things I started using are the things I'm going to talk about tonight. So, you know, I just want to talk about moisturizing because I think the two main things I do is moisturize and condition. And so far, so good. And I'm not a hair expert by any chance, but so far, so good. Um, those two things have, have worked. So moisturizing is just a process that helps to prevent your hair from being dry. And that's one thing that a lot of people don't take into consideration when they are looking after their hair. You know, your hair has to stay really, really um, well moisturized so that the ends don't split, so that it looks really, um, you know, loistered, it looks very well oiled and um, it's not gonna break because if your hair is dry, your hair is definitely gonna break. Um, and then can I have the conditioning slide, please? The conditioner slide. Thank you. And then I condition as well. So conditioners, whatever you're going to use to condition just helps to improve the condition of your hair. And why, why is that important? Because it helps to nourish, it helps to strengthen your hair shaft, and which helps to improve elasticity, especially for the kind of hair um, that we carry. Um, so one of the things that I also found out with um, hair and the fact that if it's not if it doesn't look malleable, so if it's not well moisturized, if it's not well conditioned, it's difficult for, for you to take it anywhere. Like your hair is hard, it's stiff, it's painful, you know, and then it takes a longer time for you to actually get it into shape. And when that happens, you don't want a five-year-old or a seven-year-old crying before school in the morning. So all of those things really pushed me into saying, how do I make a hair soft enough for me to do whatever style it was I wanted to do? 
So we started to, can I have the next slide please, after the moisturizing slide, thank you. So one of the things um, I did was to put all of these food products that you would eat every day. One of the things I would do was stick olive oil, just a nice 100 ml volume in a blender. I would add some eggs, I would add um, bananas, and I would add avocado and honey. And I'll blend it, make a nice um, paste out of it and just apply it on her hair and put some cling film around it and keep it for an hour. And the transformation was beautiful. You could see the elasticity come back. You know, her ends were not splitting anymore. She was growing on, on length. And the transformation between her hating her hair and not wanting to take her hair to school. And then when she saw the beauty of what her hair was becoming, it was just so beautiful. So one of the things, um, why avocado? Can I have the avocado slide, please? So avocados are really important with, like this is my combination. And, you know, some people stick aloe vera gel in it. Any, whatever it is you wanna do, just make sure that it is the things that would benefit hair growth. So avocado contains biotin, which is a B complex vitamin and that helps your hair grow healthy. And um, it also contains potassium and magnesium. Can I have the avocado slide, please? Okay. I think it's not in the deck, unfortunately, is he? Is it not? Okay, that's fine. That's all right. I'll just carry on then. So yeah, so it also avocado contains potassium and magnesium, which helps to seal the cuticles of the hair, the, the cell cuticles, and it makes your hair look smooth. So imagine, you know, a five, six year old with her hair looking smooth and silky, and you know, it makes her feel good. And that's another thing that was so important for me as well. I wanted her to identify with her hair not because sometimes when she was a lot younger, she would say, no, 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 I don't like my hair. Or I want my hair to look like that. I want my hair to look silky. Mommy, I want my hair to be long. I was like, my darling, you know, this is the hair you have. So you're gonna have to identify with it and fall in love with it. But you can't force somebody to fall in love with something that doesn't look pretty, that doesn't look, you know, beautiful or wearable. So we have to get to the place where you know, her hair was really nice and she started to identify with it. Yeah. So avocados was one of the things we would put in the blender and it was amazing. The other one was banana. Can I have the banana slide, please? I think I saw that before. Yes. So bananas contain silica, which helps to, which synthesizes collagen and that helps the hair to be stronger and it helps it to be thick. So imagine not having scanty hair only because we're not sticking the right things in it. So, you know, and before we started this journey, you could see her hair thinning out. And then after a couple of years and, you know, the, the frequency of, of how much we, we conditioned the hair with all of these products, everything just, you could see her hair was stronger, it was thicker, and you see she'll have a hand in it. You could see the pride coming back. We just enjoying her hair. And bananas also contain antimicrobial properties that would help heal flaky and dry skin, relieving dandruff symptoms. I remember I said she, she does suffer from a bit of mild eczema. So when she starts to itch, and just seeing that even just sticking all of those conditioning on was helping even the itch get better. Can I have the olive oil slide, please? So olive oil, um, I'm sure we all, everyone cooks with olive oil, most people cook with olive oil, but it's so amazing for the hair. It contains squalene, which is a hydrocarbon that helps to moisturize your hair. So we talked about moisturizing hair so that your hair is not breaking because you don't want it to stay dry. Makes it softer, makes it stronger. And it also contains oleic acid, which is a monounsaturated oil, and that helps to penetrate the hair shaft to, enable, to make sure that it stays lubricated. So when you will stick all of this in it, blend it, stick it on, no heat, just wrap it with cling film for an hour. By the time you're washing it off, you can feel the loister in the strands of hair. It's so beautiful. Next slide, please, honey. Yes, yeah, so honey as well is also an emollient and it's, huge. it's, got, it's got humectant properties, which is also an amazing moisturizer for the hair. It helps to smoothen out the hair follicles, adds amazing shine to the hair. Like I said before, yes, we want to carry our hair. Yes, we want to identify our hair. But if we do not know what we're doing with the hair, we won't be able to enjoy the hair and be proud of it. So yes, they help to, they help to add moisture to dry strands 
and um, it helps to restore the natural loist of the hair, which is so beautiful. And you can see that when that happens, your hair is bouncy and you can actually enjoy um, wearing your black hair. Can I have the egg slide, please? Yes, so we know eggs, amazing protein, good fats. They, they, they have amazing rich nutrients that the hair needs, vitamin A, vitamin E. We talked about biotin with avocado before, even folate. And this helps to also keep the hair thick. It helps to keep the hair healthy. And yes, it's loaded with good healthy fats that helps to replenish moisture and keeps the strand looking sleek and shiny. So yes, all of these things. Can I have the process slide, please? Okay, I think we probably missed that one as well. So the process, like I said, is I stick all of this in one banana, a nice scoop of oil, a nice scoop of honey, one egg. Um, I blend and then I just apply, nothing dramatic, just stick it on, keep it wrapped in cling film for an hour and it's good to go, wash it off. And then I apply some more oil and I style in any way that I want to style. Why is this important? A lot of people do not know like what product to use or how to, what to do, what not to do, but just your kitchen things. It doesn't have to be that complicated. Just going into your kitchen and sticking things together, you can still, you know, achieve the goal of making sure that your, your black hair is well conditioned and is also well moisturized. Because at the end of the day, you know, we do want to identify with our hair because it is beautiful, but the more we know what to do with it, the better we're going to be able to, identify with our black hair and enjoy it and be proud of it because that's really important especially for growing children who is coming on to you know becoming um identifying with who they are they really want to you want people you want children to love their hair love their skin it does help in the outside world because there's a lot of other things that they have to fight against and you don't want hair to be one of them so thank you very much if you do have any questions please kindly um add on Wow, thank you so much, Izzy. Thank you so much for uh, letting us know about the DIYs that we could do in the kitchen for uh, hair products and knowing the um, the appropriate you know quantities as well and components of um, what you use. And you have seen results in your daughters there, which is amazing. Thank you. Uh, I will go myself. I will go into um, over-the-counter products and black-owned lines. I'm Dr. Ginika Electrical. I'm a GP in um, Kingsley, Norfolk. I am, I've got a special interest in sexual reproductive health as well as diabetes. And I'm one of the nationally elected uh, council members of the college. And uh, before, yeah, can, can I go to the next slide, please? Dr. Sharma has talked a lot about the history of our hair. <clears throat> I just wanted to also to mention, you know, uh, one or two points, you know, because um, we know that our hair symbolizes a lot. You know, we remember uh, each time we went to make our hair when we were much younger, we would bond with friends, we would play, we would dance, we would do everything we wanted to do. And nowadays, you know, making our hair and making our daughter's hair or anyone at all, any family members, is, it just reminds us of those times. You know, we bond, we we ease of tension, you know, and um, it there is a lot of identity with our hair. We kind of like know someone's social status from the kind of hair they make, especially, you know, back home. And also it was actually used uh, during the slave trade as part of a survival and escape um, strategy. And this carried on till the revolution in the mid 1960s. If you go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> Okay, and before we go into the products, you know, I just wanted to know how we feel about our hair, you know, and um, uh, Alice, can you please help us launch the poll, please? I just want to just want a little perception about how we all feel about our hair. I've heard so many people say, oh, my hair is ugly, it's thick, it's too hard, I can't handle it. I don't like it. I don't want to be identified with it. I would prefer to just have it sleek and, you know, smooth all through. I don't know if, um, yeah, but I just wanted to know what the audience um, thinks. How confident do you feel wearing your natural hair out and to work? And then what would you say you'd love to see changed about your hair in order for you to wear it out boldly? Just a few seconds and then we will carry on. Yeah, 
Can we all see? Okay, so we have, all right, about 56% saying that they are very confident wearing their natural hair out and to work which is amazing, 20% um, not confident, 24% partially confident. And um, what would you say you'd love to see change about your hair in order for you to wear it out boldly? 37% said easy to handle and 20% um, said long. Okay, so that's um, awesome. Thank you for that. We will go to the next slide, please, Alice. Okay, so there are those that would obviously love to wear their hair out, but for some you know reasons they are not probably able to. Those you know undergoing chemotherapy, those with some medical conditions, which um, our last panel is going to talk about as well, and any you know there are so many reasons, and obviously we've got the wigs as well. We've got the Afro wigs. We've got all you know uh, different kinds of wigs and alternatives um, out there now. Thank you. Next slide, please. So um, in as much as we recommend great products, but the first step for me that I feel, you know, is, you know, towards our hair thriving is us accepting and loving and knowing our hair, because we have to marry these with the great products for us to kind of like, you know, yield results. Um, and, you know, this would actually, loving your hair would actually make you research a bit more till you find products that suit your hair needs and, you know, those that are around you, like easy found products in her kitchen. I also had to go on the journey because of my daughter. And um, I had to go on a natural hair course myself because I, I wanted to know how to kind of like help her uh, love her hair and make it easier for us to, to handle. So avoiding harmful health practices that we've accepted as norm, example, using the um, heat, regular extensions, back to back, back to back extensions and weeks both in adults and children can actually cause some problems, especially with traction alopecia. But Dr. Aitino will be talking about that later on. Next slide, please. So there are a lot of products out there, but I usually stick with black owned products, you know, from trusted sources. And after my own uh, little research, I've got a, a lot of um, people that I would, you know, recommend out there, Ori Lifestyle, Divine Roots, Equibotanics, they're all there, you know, they have, they are products that I use that works for my daughter's hair and also for my hair. Um, for good hair practices and um, for those that are here, you know, that have got Afro um, hair children as well, as well as people that they look after, you know, regular shampooing, um, before shampooing, pre-pooing with oil to kind of like help easy detangling and less breakage than shampooing, deep conditioning, leave-in conditioning, sealing with butter or oil, Protective styling, I regard protective styling as minimal styling, no strain on the hair roots, easy to take down and especially not painful. That is very crucial because if it's painful, then for me, it is not protective because it can actually cause traction to the hair roots, which could lead to traction alopecia and other, other things. And children wouldn't be happy if it was painful. So I stick with two strand twists or con rolls. Thank you. Next slide, please. So the same preferential treatment is given to those with white um, skin than black, like, you know, it's been highlighted before. Um, but, you know, with our skin, some people are, not, are unable to get um, uh, some jobs and, you know, we could be mistaken for crimes that we didn't commit because of the color of our skin. I read an article by Nadira and she said, um, if you're black, stay black. If you're brown, stick around. If you're yellow, you're mellow. If you're white, you're all right. So the most important thing tonight we should take away is love your skin, love your hair, have a routine, know when to get help, simple. Thank you, next slide, please. So as well as the skin products, I also have some um, black owned uh, um, um, professionals that I also um, get some advice from. Um, Dr. Ifomeji Keme, she's a doctor. She's got, um, she's the owner of Adonai Medical. She's got so many tips on the IG. We've got Dr. Yinka Skin as well. She's also a GP, but especially interested in aesthetics. Um, she uh, has a very good SPF, which I use. And just like uh, Dr. Sharma mentioned earlier, the use of SPF, we cannot you know, overemphasize how important it is for the skin, as well as vitamin D supplements. And um, if you have any skin issues, see your GP, 
um, he or she could refer you if they haven't if they don't know what exactly to do to the trichologist or the dermatologist. Um, our family or community members shouldn't feel afraid, honestly, to ask for referrals if something isn't working. Um, so that is my um, take on tonight. And I'll just say um, it's easier kind of like to be who you are than being someone else, really. So there is a lot going on in our community, a lot of fights, a lot of um, a lot of things really going on. And we can't, you know, let anyone put us in a box anymore to say this is the way that you should look. And we should look the way that we were created to look. So um, thank you so much. And I will call on the last panelist for tonight, which will be Dr. Aitino Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ginnika, for that um, really great talk. And uh, thank you to all the other panelists as well. I've really enjoyed listening to all of you. So I'm uh, Ituna Johnson. I'm uh, a portfolio GP um, based here in North London. Um, I um, specialize in two things. Well, I'm passionate about two things, I should say. The first being equitable healthcare, which is why I'm here tonight. Um, I also happen to be uh, the uh, diversity and equity and inclusion lead for the Northwest London Royal College of GPs faculty board, which is how I've got involved in this work um, that we're doing here tonight. Um, in addition, I also specialize in sexual and reproductive health and uh, menopause. Um, so uh, thank you for having me here tonight. Now, um, I'm going to be talking about common dermatological conditions in uh, black skin. Um, but as you can probably imagine, that is a very wide topic. Um, Shamara has already mentioned some of the uh, common uh, conditions that we see in black hair uh, and black scalps. Um, but um, Literally, if I was going to talk about, you know, I could I, I could talk about this for days. So um, I've only got 10 minutes. So I've tried to talk about the two very, very common ones and the ones that are most um, sort of dear to me in that my son and I both suffer from these two conditions. So I thought we'll start with the little spot diagnosis exercise. Um, and if you just uh, put in the Q&A or in the chat um, with the picture on the left as picture A and the picture on the right as picture B, your thoughts on what these uh, spot diagnoses are very quickly. Okay. Um, right. I don't know if I can see any answers, but okay. Um, I, I don't know. Can I see any answers? Maybe. We've got someone has said atopic dermatitis on the left, eczema, seborrheic dermatitis, eczema, post inflammatory pigmentation. Yes, yeah, so that's correct. So on the left, we've got a picture of atopic dermatitis. And we on the right, we've got a picture of seborrheic dermatitis with post-inflammatory hypo, hypopigmentation. Um, now I'm just going to put it out a, a little straw poll to see how confident people feel about diagnosing and uh, managing uh, both, of, both of these conditions in, in black skin. Great, thank you so much for um, answering. Okay, so hopefully we should have some results shortly. Right, so, um, well, a reasonable amount feel 
sort of 36% feel confident, 38% feel feel confident or very confident. But I think it's fair to say that the vast majority are either unsure or don't feel as confident. So hopefully talking about this today will try and help us um, address some of these uh, lack of uh, confidence. Um, so next slide, please. So what is atopic eczema? So uh, effectively, there's a defect in the skin barrier function, which is then enhanced by external irritants uh, that then causes an immune response, which gives rise to the symptoms that we see. In simpler terms, um, you've got um, the uh, sort of skin barrier defect and an overactive immune system. And that seems to be what kind of drives the atopic eczema. Um, and we've got this atopic triad, which some of you would have heard about, which is eczema, hay fever, and asthma. It generally tends to affect uh, people in infancy and early childhood, uh, but we also see it in adults. And the stats show that Black children born in the UK are nearly two times more likely to suffer from atopic eczema. And we also see from the stats that Black children are six times more likely to have severe disease compared to their white counterparts. And this is in part through underdiagnosis and undertreatment. But then there are other factors which we're going to discuss in the next slide. Um, next slide. So why is it so common in Black people in the diaspora? Is it genetics? Um, possibly. Uh, we know that atopic tendency tends to run in families. However, the main mutations that are implicated are actually less common in the uh, African, in populations of uh, sort of from African descent. So there's no clear genetic explanation for the higher rates seen. But of course, research is ongoing. Is it food? Sometimes, uh, but less often than we actually think. Uh, the most common is sort of cow's milk protein allergy, but this is actually seen in babies and very young children. Um, and usually there'll be associated GI symptoms. So um, I know there's quite a bit of a trend towards stopping children having milk uh, because they, people think it's, it's causing their eczema. But actually, if they don't have any gastrointestinal symptoms, it's very unlikely that that is the case. So I would make sure that you speak with a GP or a dermatologist before you actually deprive children, especially under the age of two, of milk, because actually very important for the development. Um, is it environment? Uh, probably. This is thought to be the biggest cause for the very high rates seen here in the UK. And environmental allergens seem to be the biggest. Um, so you've got things like uh, mold, dust mite, uh, pollen, grass pollen, tree pollen, all the different, you know, sort of cat hair, dog hair, um, and in fact, also hard water. Um, so all of these things can irritate the skin and drive it. But sometimes, you know, there isn't a clear allergen, um, but it's, um, but we think that it's the environment that seems to drive this and cause that sort of higher rates. And there is quite quite a lot of anecdotal evidence that eczema improves when people go to Africa or the Caribbean. And that seems to support this theory that the environment in the UK, you know, is not, drives the eczema. Right, um, next slide, please. So what does eczema look like in Black people? It's not red. That's what we were taught in medical school. <laughs> red eczema. But unless you've got a super light skinned black person, it's not going to be red. Uh, it's going to be brown. It's going to be purple. It's going to be ashen gray. Um, sometimes you have sort of hyperpigmentation, like you can see in some of the pictures. Um, sometimes you get hypopigmentation. That means too little compared to the other skin. So lighter skin than their normal skin or darker skin than their normal skin. Then dry, scaly skin. And then sometimes you get these papules. It almost looks like goosebumps. Um, you'll see it sometimes on the tummy or on the trunk. Um, and that's eczema uh, as well. Sometimes you'll get these 
prurigo nodules, which look like little bumps around the eyes from when they've itched their eyes. You see it sometimes in little kids, and that's eczema too. Um, and then you also see that lichenification is much more common, and that's that sort of leathery, uh, sort of very dry, thick skin that happens from grossly undertreated eczema. Um, and that, again, is more common in black skin. Next slide, please. Right, so how do we treat eczema? So there's a very good pediatric dermatology uh, nurse who taught me this triad, which is wash, moisturize, and intermittent steroids. And that really is the foundation for treating eczema. Now, when I say wash, I mean with emollients. Um, and really, you don't want to use soap because we have already talked that the, the background of the skin is a bit broken. So if you're using soap, that's drying out the skin and making it sort of harsher. Um, and so you want to try and use an emollient to wash. Um, you can also use a sort of a bath additive. Um, and then you want to use warm but not hot water because we know hot water also dries out the skin. Um, and then it's useful to use antimicrobial emollients such as Dermal 500. You want to moisturize liberally. And when I say liberally, like you slather it on, you should be getting through about 500 um, sort of milligrams of the um, in sort of three weeks. You should, that's how much you should be applying and you should be doing it sort of two to three times a day and I don't know if you can see this sort of uh, emollient ladder and at the very top is sort of the lotions which are kind of the least greasy thinnest and then you've got the ointments which are the thickest at the bottom so you, the preferred emollients are the ointments because they work better but I appreciate that sometimes they can get a bit greasy get a bit, a bit sticky um, and so therefore um, some people find it difficult so sometimes we advise okay you can use creams during the daytime and ointments at night to kind of help with that and then also for flares you want to use steroids now depending on how bad the eczema is you might even need steroids for maintenance so like with my son we when he has a flare we would use the steroid every day for a week and then we reduce it to every other day and then for maintenance we're using it two or three times a week um, and then um, you could also, if you've been using steroids for a long time, you can speak to your GP or dermatologist about tacrolimus that can be used as a steroid sparing treatment. Now, with the steroids as well, how much are you using? It's supposed to be one fingertip for this much eczema. So that's actually, you know, quite a significant amount. And a lot of people, because they read on the prescription or oh, use sparing, they're using such little amounts as not actually treating the condition. And undertreated eczema causes complications complications, which we talked about, like the lichenification, and also in, and it can also cause infection, which is what I'm going to talk about next, which is that actually for a lot of people, if the eczema is not is, is getting worse or the treatment doesn't seem to be working, it might be infected. And you might need to go to the GP or your dermatologist for a swab to look for, and the most common uh, bacteria would be Staphylococcus. Um, and then you might then need a topical or oral antibiotic cause. And then if a child is prone to bacteria overload with their eczema, you can then use an antimicrobial uh, wash like Octenisan to wash once or twice a week, just to reduce that antimicrobial load and, and cause their uh, eczema to be much more man manage manageable. But if you're still struggling, then you might need to go to a dermatologist for even higher level treatments. Um, so that's next slide, please. So the next condition that I wanted to talk about was seborrheic dermatitis. Um, now, this is a condition that I've lived with since I was 20 years old. So I can literally talk about it for two weeks. Um, it's a skin condition that is triggered by a fungus called Malassezia ov ovale. And that then and that then triggers the inflammation. And the theory is that the fungus hydroly hydro hydrolyzes sebum, which is an oil that is produced in the body, a natural oil um, from our sebaceous glands. And then it's the byproduct that triggers the inflammation. This is important because all the wonderful things that a lot of my colleagues have spoken about that is great for black hair is not good for the scalp with seborrheic dermatitis because a lot of the oils trigger this process and they can make it worse. So that then means that it's quite difficult, makes it even more difficult to manage. Um, so um, it's, 
it's basically there's a wide spectrum of clinical manifestations from mild dandruff to severe plaque and scale and um, you can also get um symptoms behind the ears and um, inside the ears it, on the face within the eyebrows um and then you can get it on the uh, around the sides of the nose as well um and then on the trunk and in the flexural areas which is kind of like in the armpits groins and and so on next slide so what are the challenges i've already kind of hinted about it is that what is good for our hair is bad for our scalp for people who are sufferers of seborrheic dermatitis and what is good for our scalp is unfortunately not great for our hair um, and so you're in that situation where like when I didn't realize what was going on I would go to doctors I would go to hairdressers and they were all giving me conflicting information people were telling me ah use almond oil use coconut oil use castor oil and like literally I would use the oil and it'd get worse <laughs> and then um you know, the GPs were giving me uh, a better cap, which can work. But when it wasn't dealing with the fundamental uh, sort of issues, I was like literally very, very frustrated. So a lot of the habits that are good for our hair, like co-washing, air drying, um, you know, all these things which are really, really great. Uh, unfortunately, people with seborrheic dermatitis, depending on how bad your seborrheic dermatitis is, because it is a grade, you may not be able to get away with it. Some people can if their seborrheic dermatitis is not so bad. But if it's really bad, you may not be able to get away with that. Um, also, weaves, extensions, wigs, protective styles, all of these great things that reduce the frequency of us washing our scalp can make it worse. Um, and the sad thing is also poorly managed seborrheic dermatitis on the scalp can cause hair loss and obviously combined with traction and alopecia, which one of my colleagues mentioned earlier, it can really, re really cause quite devastating effects, really. Um, and um, undertreated sort of uh, seborrheic dermatitis on the skin can cause hyperpigmentation that people may even think are, you know, you can be wrongly diagnosed as autoimmune uh, sort of hyperpigmentation when actually it's seborrheic dermatitis. Um, next slide. So how do you treat this? So there's three main options of shampoo. Uh, one's containing pyrithione zinc. And here I'm going to big up this particular product called Care Care. Uh, uh, Care Care Dry and Itchy Scalp, which is particularly good for Afro-Caribbean hair. And this is probably one of the few exceptions that is good for the scalp and okay for the hair. Um, as in for Afro hair, because this product is primarily created for people of Afro-Caribbean hair. And while it might not cure the worst of seborrheic dermatitis, it's very good in kind of, it can be help, it can be a very good tool in sort of managing the symptoms. Um, now, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, then the other, um, I've lost my. Yes. Um, sorry, I've, I seem to have lost my place on the slides. I apologize. Um, where was I? OK, so um, the next thing that you can use is ketoconazole. Now, this is an antifungal shampoo. So it really does help to try and reduce the load of that Malassezia ovale that we spoke about in the beginning. Um, and it's very, you know, it can be very, very good. And in fact, the best way to use this ketoconazole is to try and see if you can use it for five consecutive days, after which if you are, if it's a man, you can use it once or twice a week. But if it's a woman who can't really wash her hair once or twice a week and uses protective styles and stuff, then you can try and use it once every two, three, four weeks whenever you wash your hair. Um, and then there's coal tar shampoos as well, with such as Capacel, Alphacil, tea gel Now, what I tend to find is I alternate between the three. If I've used one for a prolonged period of time and my scalp is trying to say, Do you know what, I'm getting used to this, then I'll switch to another one. And then I just kind of like, like rotate them um but effectively all of these three shampoos should help you kind of manage the uh, manage the symptoms and you can kind of do a little bit of trial and error to see what works for you best 
um because there's no kind of hard science to this um in terms of what will work for you um now also very a uh, few helpful tips if there's thick scale, um, you can essentially, you know, sometimes you, you can get it's so thick you can't even lift it up with just washing. You can apply this um, Sebco ointment as a leave on treatment and then you can wash it off in the morning. So leave it on overnight and wash it off in the morning. And then also this other genius product I found is called Five Star. It contains zinc pyrithione, but it's not a shampoo. It's actually, a, a, you know, a cream. Um, so you can actually use it on your scalp. So for people with sort of protective hairstyles or, you know, if you can't wash your hair weekly, you can then use that to kind of keep the symptoms under control. And it's very effective. It's what I use, actually, um, to keep my symptoms under control in between washes. Um, and then also, you know, for severe itching and inflammation, this Betnovate scalp application can be used to calm down the inflammation. It doesn't necessarily manage the condition, but at least it can help with symptom relief. Um, and then finally, this is my last slide, um, is the sort of face and, and body symptoms. Um, you can um, wash with soap-free cleansers. And a really good one is uh, the CeraVe SA Smoothing Cleanser because it will it's give you a good wash without drying out the skin. Um, and then you can moisturize with emollients. I found recently this really fantastic product by Eucerin, very good for flaky dry skin. So I use it on my face and it really, really helps. Um, so there's quite a few on the market in Eucerin Intensive Repair Lotion, but this particular one, um, uh, it, they're different grades. I use the richest one. Um, so you can, I don't know if you can see on the pictures, very, very fit, small but you can see the different dots um the i use the richest one but obviously you, you know you can try other depending on what you prefer for your skin but i do find that eucerin is really good at helping me calm down my um facial uh symptoms and then also nizoral dactarin and clotrimazole these are all um uh, antifungal creams. You can use them as well on the eyebrows, on the sides of the nose, whenever you get those sort of symptoms. And if it's really inflamed, like you get the redness, then you can then use a steroid alongside that, like hydrocortisone or Umovate to calm it down. And um, if you get eye symptoms and you practice high eyelid hygiene with a warm compress and cleaning your eyes with the uh, cotton wool and a uh, warm water. And then obviously, if you get ear symptoms inside the ear, you can use things like Otomize and steroid sprays. So that's um, those two very, very big topics in a quick stop. Um, sorry, I've, I might have gone over time a little bit and I'm so sorry for the interruption that happened. Um, so um, I'm happy to answer any questions if anyone has them. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you, Atuna, for that. That was quite helpful. Thank you for letting us know what has worked for your own uh, seborrheic dermatitis and um, hopefully the um, the um, audience would have you know gotten you know some points from that as well. Um, I'm just going to be having a look to see if there's any questions in the in the group to see. Someone asked a question about castor oil. Um, asking what we thought about castor oil. Okay, I see easy answer the question, but um, definitely anything that works for you. Um, it's so good to kind of like research and try things out, but just, you know, to reiterate the point that um, Dr. Aitino made about the, the scalp producing its own oil. So you don't necessarily need to, you know, slather the, the scalp with oil, except you're doing a whole oil treatment, um, but that's, you know, completely different. Um, the oil you can apply to the strands or the tips of the hair just to reduce breakage, but obviously it doesn't work for everybody. And that's why you should actually know what works for you. And if it's not working, if there is a problem, shout, reach out to a GP or anybody. Um, any questions? Let's see. Can you see any questions? Okay, someone said, can you please put on the slide on treatment options again from the last speaker? Um, treatment options for the seborrheic dermatitis. Uh, Alice, please, can you put that up? Thank you. Thank you. Is it this one, you know, or is it the... Um, is it this one? one? Is it this one or the previous one? I think it's the previous one as well. Yeah, the one before. Yeah, no. Next, please. No. 
No, the second to the last slide. Yeah, that's it. This is the one. Okay, thank you. So um, I don't know if we have any final words for um, the audience tonight. We we have got very few minutes, about five minutes left um, to end this session. Um, I will start with you, Shama. Do you have any last? Um, I think some people have questions, but as you say, we've not got that long left. And this topic, we could probably have like a year long course about all these different things um someone mentioned that you know they specifically joined you know learn about different conditions on black skin um there are resources out there that people have kindly put in the chat um but i think just you having that inclination and that wanting to learn more about it is such a good starter um for the person that asked that and just looking um when you're when you're treating black patients just knowing that the the symptoms that they're coming to you with might not look like what you believe them to look like and just having that inquisition behind you um but yeah awesome there is a question here about razor bombs um dr Aitino, can you are you able to say something on that yes um so basically um you know, we see this a lot, especially with um, pseudo folliculitis barbae, um, which I'm, um, it, it's very tricky because, you know, a lot of our uh, men and women, you know, like to sort of shave their hair regularly. And what I would say is that it's very important that we, because often what happens is that when you're using the same razor and you haven't cleaned it properly a lot of the time it can be reinfecting um the um and causing those those bumps which oftentimes are kind of pseudo sort of in inflammation or infection from the bacteria that normally live on the skin but are kind of inoculated in the skin by the process of um shaving um, so effectively, um, one of the things that I always uh, kind of um, recommend to the patients that come in with this is make sure you clean um, the razor that or the shaving, uh, whatever you're using to shave properly um, and make sure that after each use, you clean it to try and reduce the, 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 the chances of kind of inoculating it. And then the other thing is I often, um, because if you've got a flare, um, you might need some topical um, antibiotics, um, such as a uh, fusidic acid. And sometimes I'd even give fusidic, uh, fusidin H to kind of help calm down that inflammation. Um, and um, I mean, the other thing again is just making sure that, you know, you want to try and reduce that, that, that staph skin load. Um, so you can, especially if it's kind of like towards the neck or sort of neck area, you can advise things like dermal 500 or tenisan to try and see if you can reduce um, that skin, that staff skin, uh, staff load on the skin to kind of reduce the chances of causing those uh, symptoms. I hope that helps. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I think, um, okay, easy. Dr. Easy, you wanted to say something. Thank you very much, Etienne. Can I just add a bit to that? So, you know, with the um, the razor bomb, so one of the things that would initially cause any razor bomb is the fact that when you shave, you don't take out the root, the hair from the roots. So the tiny hairs that are left, they go back into the skin and they infect the skin, they cause redness, they cause bumps and they cause pain. So one of the things that have worked for me personally is that you have to switch from using razor blades. So rather than continue to shave and cause that irritation and cause those tiny hairs to go back into the skin to irritate your skin, just shift to something like creams for shaving creams, or I have learned how to, I've had to learn how to wax because that's the, it takes the hair out of the roots. So what you want to do is take the hair out of the roots rather than cut the hair and then you have this space for the hair to curl back into the skin. So one of the things that I would 100% recommend tried and tested is that if you're getting razor bumps rather than continue to use the razor just switch to either creams or waxing i hope that was helpful yes very very helpful and um, um i don't know how much more we can go over 
but um, I'm just looking through the questions to see if there's any any other questions. Um, someone said baby check conditions, please, please cover baby check. Um, does that mean eczema? Um, can you please explain? Okay, and then there's another uh, question here, uh, differentiating between seborrheic dermatitis and other scalp conditions like uh, psoriasis or carry-on. So carry-on, yeah. And um, I don't know, I think you, are you typing something there? Um, yes, I was. I was just going to say that, you know, I mean, sometimes it can be actually quite difficult, um, particularly between seborrheic dermatitis and uh, psoriasis, particularly if they don't have any other um, body symptoms. So generally speaking, what I would do is I would try and do a full skin examination and examine their bodies because generally speaking, if they're looking at the pattern of the, the, the so for example, we know where the areas that seborrheic dermatitis seems to affect uh, versus the areas that psoriasis seems to affect. So say for example, if they have a uh, plaques on their uh, on their elbows uh, in sort of in addition to you know, like I mean obviously that's a that's a basic example but uh, I'm just saying um then that can give you a hint uh, because they can actually look very very alike um particularly in black skin um but um I think again it's also a sort of experience uh, because effectively scalp psoriasis and seborrheic dermatitis are treated very, very similarly. Um, so even if you kind of get it wrong um, and you treat seborrheic dermatitis like uh, scalp psoriasis, you're not really going to cause much harm. Uh, it's, it's more like um, if you kind of I don't know if that makes much sense. Carry on, maybe slightly different because um, that's more like a fungal sort of infection on the scalp that can be quite, you know, um, in, in children, more common in children. And um, I would say that, you know, you get, you get, I, I suppose early carry on can also be a little bit confusing, but I think it does look slightly different to seborrheic uh, dermatitis and um psoriasis um so i think you know getting you know if you're not sure look at pictures on dermnet um look at pictures on um pcds have a really good website as well that's the primary care and then all these other sort of um websites of um like the brown um skin am i saying the right one yeah I mean, <laughs> uh, the, the mind but there are sort of other websites that have pictures um, and images of what these conditions look like in black skin just to give you that uh, sort of confidence but you know the thing about it is you might get it wrong sometimes even the best of the best clinicians sometimes struggle with the difference between some of these conditions so um you know if you're trying treatment for one and it's not quite working, then you could think, okay, have I got it wrong? Um, and you can try treatment or you can get specialist advice or advice from other colleagues. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. And now we have the consult and connect that we could always take a picture and just send and say, do you think this is this? Are we treating it? Are we managing it all right? And, you know, things like that. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think the baby, okay, the baby check conditions was uh, the Mongolian spot or the strawberry um, uh, uh, mevi, which the Mongolian spot, that's the one that is found in like our, our children, the, the grayish, gray, grayish um, black spot that could be found on the bum or, you know, the spine region or, you know, those areas. And that's one of the things that we need to record during the baby checks to say that this is because sometimes it could look like a non-accidental um, um, scar or injury. So it's quite important to actually note and record those things. And the strawberry nevus is, you know, is that, that's the, the, the red one, the hemangioma, the collection of the blood vessels that we should also record. And those ones, sometimes they tend to, you know, disappear. Um, just a few percentage of them persist. Um, so I don't know if there's any other questions. I hope we've answered. This um, presentation will be on YouTube. So I don't know if it's possible for us to kind of like collate the questions as well and post there with the answers um, just so everyone is um, able, just for the ones that we're not able to, to take because we've gone past the time. And um, yes, so... Um, Okay, so I think that would be it for tonight. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Thank you so much to the panelists. Thank you, Alice, for 
um, your, your behind the scene role that is quite important. Thank you so much. And uh, I think I've taken a lot out of this session and I hope you have to let us, you know, try to educate our children, both the boys and girls, enlighten them about their culture, let them be proud of their heritage, proud of their hair, proud of their skin, let them know when to actually ask for help as well. Um, this is a time to act, it's no longer just about words, it's time to act now. So we are ensuring that um, children are no longer sent home from school because of their you know, hair, I mean, it is part of who we are. We can't take our hair away from us and we can't be confident in one part of us and not be confident in the other part. We need to be confident as a whole, both our hair and skin. Thank you so much, everybody. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>